In order to talk to you about the subject that I'd like to talk to you about today, I'd like to give you a little background. It has been my experience as a teacher, and I've been teaching, I guess now, it's been about 15 years now that I've been teaching. And so I've accumulated some experience. My experience has been that here in the West, when students come to Dharma, when they embrace Dharma, and even when they've been practicing Dharma for a long time, they have the attitude that, and it's an incorrect attitude, it bears examining. We have the attitude here in the West that we as people are going to that church or that temple which is out there somewhere. We go there and we act in a certain way according to the beliefs of that church or that temple and then we go home and we continue on with our lives as though our lives have not been changed. As though nothing has been heard at this church or temple that is relevant to our lives. And we don't even realize that we've done that. But it's such a deep prejudice that each of us have, this idea, this prejudice, or that, this idea that one's spiritual life or one's religious life is somehow separate from the rest of one's life. It, 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 for Westerners, it is a deep prejudice to the point where it is almost invisible. It, it's so, so much a part of us that it has become, in a sense, part of our background, part of our, part of our, the landscape within our minds. We can't pick this out and say, oh, look at that. It's hard for us, at least, to pick this out and say, look at that. I act this way when I'm around the temple and I'm thinking about Dharma and I'm thinking about the Buddhist teaching, specifically when I'm doing particular Dharma practice. I act this way and then I go home and I proceed as though I'd never heard of it. We don't even realize to what extent we do that. Oh, it's not to say that we don't hear anything and we don't try to do anything with our practice. For instance, if a teacher were to say to us, all right, now I've given you this empowerment, and this often does happen when a teacher gives empowerment, the teacher will say, now I've given you this empowerment, I need something from you in exchange. And what I need from you is in exchange is uh, the commitment to good moral conduct, let's say or what I need for, from you in exchange is the commitment to never kill or harm another living being. And so when we have a directive like that, we, can we fixate on that. We can, that's, we can put that in our pockets. That's a direct order. We can hear that. It's something we can carry around and it's easy. So maybe we go home and maybe we don't kill anything anymore. Maybe we do things like instead of getting out the old fly swatter, we capture the flies and we take them outside. So that's our big effort as a Buddhist. The flies are thrilled. So, but the rest of the, what the teacher taught, and the teacher taught a lot within the context of, for instance, commentary teaching and what have you, those thoughts that should gentle the mind and turn the mind toward Dharma, that should make us see more clearly, that should make us live better and in a higher way, more responsible way. These things we often miss. These things we don't carry home with us. A good, for instance, is the idea that, and, and these are some of the thoughts that we are taught that turn our mind toward Dharma. This is a, an excellent example. Uh, this is something that every teacher will teach you the first time they see you and they will teach you every time they see you until the last time they see you. In one form or another, you will hear the same teaching. And that is the uh, thought that samsara, or the cycle of death and rebirth, <coughs> is tricky, seductive, that it is a narcotic, that samsaric living deludes us into a feeling of safety, but that in fact, our lives, which are samsaric lives, which are, since we have been born, they are involved in the cycle of birth and, birth and death, our lives in fact, according to the Dharma teaching, pass as quickly as a waterfall rushing down a mountain. 
That's an interesting thought, and actually that's a very interesting image. It's a perfect image, in fact, by which this teaching can be taught. And the reason why is that when you look at a waterfall rushing down a mountain, you might see a waterfall rushing down a mountain for hundreds of years, thousands of years. You could go to some place where there's a very high mountain. Perhaps there's been a waterfall there for a thousand years. And so you might think to yourself, my life is going to be as fast as a waterfall rushing down a mountain? Good deal. Except that's not how it's meant, you see. Because what the Buddha is talking about is that if you took one cup of water and dropped it from the top of the waterfall, it would be down at the bottom of the waterfall in a flash. You couldn't even follow it with your eyes. It would happen so fast. And that is how fast our lives pass. Now, when we are looking at our lives, we look at it the way we look at a waterfall going down a mountain. We don't see the cup of water. We don't think like that. We don't want to think like that. Who wants to think like that? We see the waterfall as being something stable. So this analogy becomes perfect. It's perfect, really. When we look at our lives, even though the evidence is clear, I don't know about you, but I don't look the same way as I did 10 years ago. Do you? Even if you're 20, when you were 10 years ago, you were 10. You still don't look the same way as you did 10 years ago. When you're 45, you know you don't look the same way as you did when you were 35. And so the evidence is clear, and you see it every morning. You see it every morning when you brush your teeth or do your hair or shave or whatever it is that you do. You know about it. In fact, you're playing this little game with yourself. I know because we all play this little game. Trust me on this. Especially the women can really identify this. We play this little game with ourselves. We're not graying because we can go to the hairdresser and he will fix it. And every now and then we get really brave when the guy's up there fooling with our hair and putting the glop on. We say, okay, how bad is it? How gray am I? And I don't know about your hairdresser, but my hairdresser takes my hand and lovingly speaks to me and says, you will never be gray. I will help. <laughs> <laughs> and so the delusion goes on, you see? It simply goes on. And we're not facing it. We're not facing the fact that this thing that we are most afraid of is actually happening. Why is it we're not facing that? Because of the very nature of samsara, it is like drinking alcohol. It's like taking a narcotic. There's something about the way we proceed in samsara. There's something about the way we register data that causes us to not see time passing, to remain fixated on a certain internal idea and not really taking into account what is actually happening. We learn instead to accommodate ourselves. We start dyeing our hair. We put on more makeup than we did 10 years ago. What else do we do? If we're men, some of our men, men are not, women are not the only ones that dye their hair. This I have found out. This is the truth. Women are not the only ones that are doing it. Men are doing it too. Or they use that, what is that stuff that you comb in and it takes? Grecian formula, yeah. Grecian formula. Some men use the Grecian formula. And then, uh, then others of us, uh, we, we have different ways of, of not dealing with reality. You know, you get to be maybe 45, 50 years old, and you realize you can't do what you did before. You just cannot, you don't do what, you don't want to do what you did before. But you simply cannot. Physically, you cannot do what you did before. And so the way that you deal with that, instead of really dealing with that and really looking at that, is you, th you sort of change your lifestyle. And you think, oh, what I'd really like now is a change of lifestyle, where coincidentally, I am slower. <laughs> I don't have to walk or run as fast. Uh, I coincidentally would like to have a house with less stairs. <laughs> I coincidentally would like to have clothes that are a little looser on me than they used to be. And I coincidentally would like to, um, <clears throat> let's see, I would like to get my children out of the house at last. No, never mind. Um, 
I'm only saying that because I know one of them is listening. <laughs> I thought I'd take care of a little family business while I'm at home. <laughs> it never works. Anyway, some of us, you know, the, the men, for instance, when they're, when they're younger, what they really want most in this world is a motorcycle. Uh, want a motorcycle so bad you can taste it. You would do anything for a motorcycle, or maybe a, a new guitar, or a fast car, or whatever it is that young men really want. And then when we get older, we don't face the fact that we o we're older, but suddenly we want a, a town and country car. The kind that has a special kind of seat for lower back pain. <laughs> and then we get one of those beaded things you put on the seat for hemorrhoids or whatever. <laughs> but it's all right, because nothing's really changed. I'm still a good-looking man. You know, that's the way we think. We just, we, we're just missing something here. We are not facing reality. And another thing that happens that's pretty interesting to me, too, while we're not facing reality, we also operate under the delusion that when we come here to practice Buddhism, we're doing somebody a favor by doing this. It, it's the truth. It is the truth. In, in my 15 years as, as a teacher, I will tell you I have had this experience again and again and again. When students will come to class and they'll look at you like, well, I'm here, isn't that great? <laughs> Aren't you happy? Aren't you pleased with me? And then, um, <clears throat> and then they will say things like, um, oh, um, Jetsama wants another stupa, so we better build another stupa because Jetsama wants it. I don't need another stupa. I'm very happy with the stupas that we have. In fact, I would have been okay if we never had built a stupa. Guess who needs the stupa? <laughs> Come on, you can do this. <laughs> you do. You're right. You're the ones that need the stupa. And then uh, th people will say to me, you know, they'll, they'll give you this attitude like, um, well, Jetsama likes the temple clean, so we better come and clean the temple. No, Jetsama has a real solution. If the temple gets dirty enough, Jetsama can stay home in her clean house. <laughs> so Jetsama really doesn't need the temple clean. You need the temple clean. You need to do that. Because the Buddhist teachings tell us that if you are to build a stupa or to clean one of, or to, to care for the body of the three precious jewels, and here the three precious jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, are housed in this temple, then you are accumulating merit. You are changing your life. You are benefiting yourself, and you are moving closer to enlightenment by accumulating merit and purifying your own non-virtuous deeds which all of us have accumulated. We've all had non-virtuous deeds in our past. But we don't want to face that. We don't want to think like that. We don't want to think that we have any needs at all. We don't really want to look at our own fragile situation. We are afraid, and we don't want to admit it. Now, my, my experience has been that we are in such denial about our situation that we literally paralyze ourselves on the path. We prevent ourselves from going very far because we have not cultivated the kind of thinking that permits us and encourages us to practice more deeply and to go further on the path than we are going. Many of us are resistant to contributing to the temple. We are interested in coming to receive a teaching and then we are interested in going home and enjoying the rest of the day. We are interested in um, bringing friends to this exotic place. We are interested in seeing what this is all about. We are interested in, well, you know, if any of you have received empowerments in the Vajrayana tradition, the Tibetan tradition, you know that we get pretty high church around here. You know, it, 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 we have a lot of ritual and a lot of color, and if you've come when the Tibetan lamas are here, you know that we have ritual instruments and ritual music and all sorts of really interesting exotic things. And unfortunately, many people come and dabble in Dharma simply because it is so exotic, but they miss 
the essential point, and that is the Buddha's heart advice to you, the Buddha's heart teaching. And that heart teaching, that heart advice, is encompassed and embraced in the thoughts that turn the mind towards Dharma. <clears throat> and those thoughts are that, first of all, we are existing right now in a precious and rare human rebirth. That according to the Buddhist teaching, it is very difficult to achieve this human rebirth. Because in order to achieve this human rebirth, you have to have accumulated enough virtue, enough merit in your past, number one. And number, number two, you have to have made some effort to move toward realization or to move toward benefiting others. There has to have been some element of <laughs> movement toward the spiritual in your past. Now remember that those that have taken a lower rebirth, such as the animals, are not capable of thought like that at all. So they will not be accumulating the causes for a human rebirth in their present lifetime. They will not be able to do that. According to the Buddhist teaching, however, we have somehow managed to achieve this human rebirth, and it's a bit like um, a great way to understand how rare that would be uh, and, and how miraculous it is, is to think about, well, a gambling place like Atlantic City or Las Vegas, you know, where they have those, um, that machine called the one-armed bandit. Have you ever heard about, you know, you pull the machine and it comes up like a, a fruit, three different kinds of fruit or three different lemons or three different cherries. It's a gambling machine. Slot machine, is that what that is? Okay. So, uh, our achieving a precious human rebirth is a bit like coming up with you know, the three cherries in the row and you get the, you get the prize. But it is infinitely more rare than that. Infinitely more rare than that. <clears throat> and, the and, and the next thing that the Buddha teaches us is that this precious human rebirth is very, very brief. As brief as a waterfall going down a mountain. And you know there is no way that you can appreciate that when you're young. There is no way. I know because I've been young and I've been middle-aged, which is what I am now. And there's no way. There's no way. No matter how smart you are, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how you try to stop and think about it, it is so difficult to understand how quickly our lives pass. And when we reach middle age, you know, the, the big hubbub, everybody talks about how we all have midlife crisis. Well, that's what it's about. It's during the middle of our lives when we realize that basically we have been, we have been on a weekend pass and honey, it is Saturday night late. And the only thing you've got left is Sunday. You remember how you used to feel when you were a kid and you looked forward to the weekend so much all weekend long and by the time it was Saturday night, you have this kind of funny feeling realizing that it's pretty much gone. You know, the only, have, only thing you have next is Sunday and you have to go to church the next day. <laughs> so that's how we think. And right around midlife, we begin to understand that life is very short. But it's very difficult to understand it before that. Particularly since in our culture, we are not permitted to see death very much. When our relatives die, they put them in a bag and cart them off. We never get to see them. We get to see them when they look pretty. That's truth. They pretty them up. And then they show them to us after that. But we never really understand what has happened. So we're shielded, even, from having that kind of sensibility. Well, not only is life quick, but there are certain hidden rules within our lives that we cannot take in. Why can't we take them in? First of all, our minds don't want to take them in. In the same way that uh, when we are in a traumatic situ situation, we often shield ourselves by being in denial about that situation. You know, how many of you know about that little psychological trick of denial? Ever had any denial in your life? <laughs> any of you married? <laughs> so. <laughs> so we have that wonderful trick of denial. 
we are in denial about what is happening with our lives. We just don't think about it at all. And then the other thing about it is that if you think about how our minds work, what are your earliest memories? Some people say they can remember infancy. Some people say they can remember two years old. Some people say four. Usually it's about three or four years old that you can have your earliest, earliest shreds of memory. It's usually that's the case. From that time until the age that you are now, that's all the real memory that you have. So you have a problem, and that is you cannot learn cause and effect. There's no way that you can learn cause and effect thoroughly from your life. Do you know why that is? Because many of the causes that have caused your life to be the way it is now did not happen in this lifetime. According to the Buddhist teaching, you have lived many times before. Not once, not ten times, but uncountable times in many different forms. And many, most of the causes that bring about the results of your life right now have been brought about or have been birthed previous to this incarnation. So you can't possibly make the connection between cause and effect. You know, uh, many people resent the idea that it's actually karma or cause and effect that causes us to suffer when we suffer because we don't like the idea of thinking that we actually deserve this. We don't like that kind of idea. We don't like the idea that we may have been bad in the past. Well, that's just because it, that, that kind of thinking is a bit childlike, isn't it? And truly, it's a bit childlike. Many of the causes that you can't actually, well, let me backtrack a little bit. When you look at your life right now, let's say you are experiencing extreme poverty, or let's say you are experiencing some kind of terrible illness. If you're experiencing extreme poverty, it's probably because in the past you have had a lack of generosity toward others. If you, have, uh, if you are experiencing some uh, terrible disease, it's probably because in the past you have broken some vows or commitments that you made with your body. These are the Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> Those things may not have happened in this lifetime, probably have not happened in this lifetime. Maybe in this lifetime you're very generous. Maybe in this lifetime you're keeping as many commitments as you can possibly manage. Maybe you're doing the very best that you can. Doesn't it seem unfair, therefore, that you would suffer from something that happened at a previous incarnation? Well, what, what's really unfair about it is that you can't connect the dots. That's the problem. You can't connect the dots. There's no way that we, as ordinary samsaric beings, ordinary sentient beings, with limited view, can possibly connect those dots. It's impossible. If you were ex uh, uh, seeing that your life was filled with, with terrible poverty and that no matter what you did, there was no way to get out of it. And yet you look at your life and you think, well, I, I have been generous. I've tried, you know. I mean, I've, I've tried to give to others. I've tried to be kind. I mean, I haven't always done it perfectly, but I've tried. So why, why do I deserve this poverty? It's very difficult for us under that kind of situation to do anything other than feel sorry for ourselves. And that's what most of us end up doing. So we end up perpetuating the myth that nothing is connected with nothing, that we don't have to work at it, we don't have to think about it, it's just luck of the draw. And so we end up spending most of our lives in denial and complaining and just not getting the big picture. That is the worst thing about samsara. That, I think, in my opinion, is much worse than how fast our lives go. I mean, if, if we have just a, even a, a meager lifespan of, say, 60 years, if we really got it, if we really understood cause and effect, we would probably be motivated to start practicing early and by the time we were 60 and ready to die we'd have something accomplished we would have prepared for our next rebirth but we don't do that because we cannot connect the dots <clears throat> we wait 
You know, I think about the young people that I know, and even the young people that are very close to me. They have the idea that they have all the time in the world. I know because I used to have that idea. All the time in the world. It's like Friday night. You've got the whole weekend. So party hardy. It's really like that. We really have this idea. So when we're young, we do not begin our practice. And then when we're not so young, when we move into real adulthood, we still are in denial. We still, when we're, I tell you, when we're finished being young, the next st stage is to pretend that we're young. That's the next thing we do. To pre and then after pretending that we're young doesn't work, we imagine that we're young. It's sort of like that. And we keep pushing off the inevitable, which is that moment when we get that life is really passing and there really is something that must be done. This kind of narcotic quality that is part and parcel with samsaric existence is the real enemy here. It is the real enemy. And it causes us to think very strangely in, in an odd way, a way that is not productive and, and is not protective and, it, and beneficial toward ourselves. We are not being our own best friends, in other words. So <clears throat> what happens is we are deluded, we are stuck, we stay without any understanding, we simply cannot commit to practice, we, we, just, we have this Scarlet O'Hara kind of idea that tomorrow is soon enough. Tomorrow everything will be fine. And so we find ourselves in something of a bind. Now, it's, it's a person who has not been able to practice these thoughts that turn the mind toward Dharma that is in the most trouble because they can't move to the next step and that's the next thought that, that turns the mind towards Dharma. And it's a very simple one. It's actually very lo logical. It's about as logical as the law of gravity seems to be. And the law of gravity seems to be pretty logical. Drop it, goes down every time to, that I've seen. I mean, show me something different, but every time I've seen it. So the law of gravity is, is kind of logical. It means that I, I don't know the physics of it, but basically this is heavier than the air that it displaces, so it's going down. And the Earth <clears throat> will pull it down because of the magnetic quality that the motion of the Earth produces. So we know this, we understand that this is very logical. But there is another logical truth that we are missing completely. And it's just as logical, equally as logical. But again, we're playing the game of forever young, never going to die, and always deluded. That's the game we're playing. And here's the truth that is logical, the truth that we're missing that is so simple. If you think about it, you know it's true. And it's this. Non-virtuous behavior, such as killing, stealing, adultery, judgment, lack of kindness, lack of generosity, harming others, lying, the, these kinds of activities bring about unhappiness every time. There is no case in which you can engage in non-virtuous beha behavior in order to produce happy results. It will never happen. It will never happen. In the same way that apple seeds will not grow orange trees, it simply doesn't happen. Non-virtuous behavior, negative behavior, will always, every time, bring unhappiness. And the funny thing is we often, we, most, we always engage in non-virtuous activity in order to bring us happiness. That's what we think we're doing. We lie about somebody else so that, let's see, I might lie about that person. Let's, uh, here, here's a good example. Let's say um, um, I have a, a boyfriend and my boyfriend loves two women. I'm one of them. So I might, in order to bring my own happiness, lie about that other woman and say, oh, she's no good. No, you don't want her. She's no good. I might lie about that other woman so that this boyfriend, so I can have this boyfriend. And I'm thinking that this lie is going to bring me happiness. 
It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Because eventually what's going to happen is someday you're going to want something very much. Someday you're going to be completely and totally entitled to something. And that person will be able to keep that from you. You see? May not happen for in this lifetime. May not happen in the next lifetime. Could happen 10,000 lifetimes from now where you couldn't possibly remember. But it will make you unhappy. Eventually, it will make you unhappy. So uh, the same way with, um, let's say, people that uh, like to gain power over others. That, a, a lot of people play the power game of trying to gain power and domination over other people simply because they feel if they can control others, it will make them happy. They will be powerful. They will be, uh, you know, shielded from hurt because they are dominant and others are weaker than them. And so they don't care whether they hurt the people under them or not. They do whatever they want to do in order to make themselves happy. That's what people do. What they don't realize is that in every conceivable sense, they are making themselves more and more unhappy. That that kind of power over others will never produce happiness. That in some future time, that very person who, who is such a power monger will be the most powerless of sentient beings. Think about the helpless little creatures that are kept in cages in pet shops to be sold to who knows. Think about the helpless little creatures that are kept in laboratories to be tested on for who knows what purpose. That kind of helplessness. And so we're talking about terrible suffering and unhappiness, and we bring it on ourselves through cause and effect relationships. So this is one of the teachings that the Buddha has given us that is very, very logical. And we can see small examples of it within our lives. That if we engage in non-virtuous behavior, it will produce unhappiness. If you're old enough, you've seen some of that in your life, if your eyes are open at all. If your eyes are open at all, you have seen that you have often boxed your own ears, that you have often hurt yourself by engaging in non-virtuous activity that has brought you suffering. So maybe you've had time to see a little bit of that, but I'll tell you that according to the Buddhist teaching, and this is the truth, every bit of non-virtuous behavior that you have engaged in will bring about unhappiness. So it's not logical to engage in non-virtuous behavior. And that includes the lesser non-virtuous behaviors. I mean, the big ones like killing, we can get that. Killing, stealing, you know, that sort of thing. But what about simple selfishness? What about judgment of others? What about just not giving a big flip? Just not caring. What about reading the newspaper and thinking, wow, millions of people are starving over there. Too bad. That, you don't think that's a non-virtue? That's how we read the paper. Every day. Of course that's a non-virtue. We're, we're not caring. We're not praying for them. We're not sending them anything. We're not doing anything to help. Now, the Buddha also taught us that virtuous behavior brings about happiness. <clears throat> but we have exactly the opposite idea. Most of us don't like to practice, for instance. We don't like to sit down and practice. Who likes to sit down for two hours at a stretch? I don't know about you, but I get fanny f fatigue big time. <laughs> two hours at a stretch. That's just not how I want to spend the day. And so we think like that. We think, oh, you know, if I sit down today and practice for two hours, I'm really going to suffer. So we have this weird idea that virtuous activity like, like practice is going to bring about unhappiness. <clears throat> and it's because of our lack of understanding. What we don't realize is that, yes, while we will have maybe the antsiness or the fanny fatigue or whatever it is that we get, ultimately that two hours of practice will ripen. And when it ripens, it will be like a precious jewel within your life. At some point, there will be an event or a change, or a lift, or a gift, or something that you very much need in your life. And it will appear as though out of nowhere. And it can be directly traced 
to previous virtuous behavior. The Buddha also teaches us that if we offer uh, even something, if we're very poor and all we have is something simple like a candle or a butter lamp, if we offer, offer only that, uh, placing it on an altar and with a full and generous heart, visualize it as being everything that we have, everything that we could ever have, and offer it to the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, and particularly to the Lama as the representative of all three, for the sake of sentient beings, to be used, that let that merit be used to benefit sentient beings. What we don't realize is that while that took some time out of our busy day, yes, and we did have to prepare a butter lamp or light the candle or whatever hardship we had to engage in, still we have created unbelievable happiness for ourselves. And actually, the Buddha has taught that if we could manage to make that offering with complete and total absorption, in the giving of that, in the generosity, in the expanse of that generosity, then we would be reborn eventually in immovable samadhi, complete happiness. Because we are engaging in that kind of activity that creates the habitual tendency of supreme generosity. We are taught also to make offerings of our body, speech, and mind. For instance, we visualize that our body becomes like food, and we, th and we offer our body. You know, of course, this, we don't cut off pieces of ourselves. and give, Nobody would want to eat that anyway, I don't think. But <laughs> we do visualize our body as being transformed into this nectar that nourishes all sentient beings. And without holding on to ourselves, we offer ourselves in that way. So we offer our body to benefit sentient beings. We offer our speech to benefit sentient beings. We practice so that what comes out of our mouth will be of benefit to others, such as mantra or teaching about dharma or some spiritual advice. We try very hard to, uh, to give our speech to benefit sentient beings. And we offer our mind as well to benefit sentient beings. We make that offering uh, and the way that we practice that offering is by no longer using our mind as a vehicle by which to accomplish non-virtue. But instead, we use our mind as a vehicle by which to accomplish virtue for the sake of sentient beings. And that's the true meaning of offering our body, our speech, and our mind. Many practitioners, unfortunately, say that. They say, I offer my body, speech, and mind, and they, you know, they make all kinds of grand gestures. But boy, when it comes down to the clinch, they ain't offering nothing. And that's the truth. Not a thing. It just isn't happening. So we, as Dharma practitioners, have to learn how to practice more deeply than that. In order to accumulate the causes for true happiness, it is that kind of virtuous activity that we have to engage in. <clears throat> also, within the context of your life, perhaps you may have been born rich. Or perhaps during the course of your life, it has been relatively easy for you to make money, gain riches. Or perhaps during the course of your life, at some point, you have inherited uh, riches. And you wonder to yourself, how is it that I see, I hear about the starving poor, and yet I, who wasn't even hungry in the first place, have inherited this money or I have come into this money? How is it? It would seem as though I am completely undeserving. How has that happened? You wonder about that. Why is it easy for me to make money? Well, the reason why it is easy for you to inherit that money or to make that money is because sometime in the past, you have earned it. And the way that you have earned it is by engaging in virtuous activity concerned with generosity toward others. You have given food to others. In this life, you always have enough to eat and more. In fact, the problem is not eating too much. So then, <clears throat> If you have a lot of money and things have been pretty comfortable for you, then sometime in the past you must have been very generous toward others. And your big problem in this lifetime is not how to make money, but how to spend it or not spend it. <clears throat> in that case, <clears throat> you, have, you deserve everything that you get. You deserve all of it. Now, in this lifetime, if you just take that money and, and, and express it by um, through, 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 through no acts of generosity, if you sort, sort of just like, let's say you, you, uh, maybe you keep it in your family to make sure that your children are provided for. Well, that's a kind of generosity. You did give some to your children, but that isn't 
real generosity because children are kind of like an extension of our own ego. We think of them as part of us. We don't think of them as being separate from us. We like our children to be rich because it's a good reflection on us and it makes us die happy. But let's say in this lifetime, although you have lots of money, you haven't really given any to benefit others. You haven't helped others not to be hungry. You haven't given it to children that don't get any toys at Christmas. You haven't made any offerings to the temple where you receive <clears throat> all your spiritual benefit. <clears throat> you haven't done, excuse me, <clears throat> you haven't done anything with your money. And do you think then that in your next life you're going to somehow be able to legally make it happen that they'll find you in your next incarnation and give you back that money? Au contraire, my sure. <laughs> That's Brooklyn for no. <laughs> so it is not like that at all. It's not like that at all. It's not going to happen. First of all, no one will know where you've gone after you die. You can't take it with you. It's not going to appear again in your next life. Forget it. It's not going to happen. But in your next life, you will probably be born much poorer. Because even though you had the money before, you were not very generous. So it's very, very clear that cause and effect are interconnected. In fact, the Buddha teaches us that they ri arise interdependently. That when the cause arises, the effect arises at the same time, but in seed form. So they arise. Once the moment, think about that. Now think about that the next time you have non-virtuous behavior. The re one of the reasons why it's so easy to be non-virtuous is because you think, well, okay, I'm being non-virtuous now, but I don't see the effect rising yet. So maybe they, who are they anyway? We don't know. They'll forget about it. You know, the guys with the X's and the checks, they're up there. He's sitting on the throne, you know, the guy with the long beard. Maybe he'll forget about it by then. But in fact, the Buddha teaches that, number one, there's nobody with a book up there or a beard. And number two, when you give rise to the cause, the effect is already born. And you will experience it. You will experience it. Now, these are the thoughts that we do not accomplish because initially they are uncomfortable. They are painful. We do not want to know this. I know what it's like to be a little girl. I know what it's like to be a young woman. And my experience has been, and as an American woman, my experience has been, and I'm, I'm sure we all share this, men and women alike. We have this idea that, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're young, you know that by the time you get to be an adult, you're going to have all the answers. And in fact, you do have all the answers until you're about 25. Before that, you're omnipotent, you see. And then when you're 25, you're no longer omnipotent. And you know why that is? Because you have a brain that has finally started to grow in your cranium. Before that, it was only brain buds. <laughs> so anyway, now that you're about 25, you're beginning to realize that you don't have all the answers. And the, uh, the, um, the omniscience, the supreme omniscience that you were afflicted with earlier uh, is dissipating. And that happened to me, too. When I was little, I used to think, when I grow up, I'm going to be completely comfortable. I'm going to, I am, I'm going to, here, I thought, when I have children, I'm going to raise them just this way, and I will never do this, and I will always do this. How, who, who's, had, who's had good luck with that, I want to know. <laughs> have you ever heard yourself yelling at your kid, and you find out you are your mother? You have turned into your mother for real? Well, that kind of thing has happened. And you also, you grow up and you think, when I grow up, I'm going to have all the answers. When I grow up, I'm going to be secure. When I grow up, I'll have financial things work out. I'm, I'm, it's, go, it's all going to come together for me. When you're young, you think like that. And when you're older, you realize almost none of it's going to come together for you. Almost none of it. Some, yeah. There are good things in life. There are good things in samsara. But you realize that it's not what it seems to be. As practitioners, and these are some closing thoughts, this is really what you have to take away with you. As a practitioner, you cannot fall into the trap that we as younger people fall into. You can't stay there very long. And you that are younger, 
you need to start thinking about this. Create the habit of thinking about this. Samsara is a deluded experience. It's like a narcotic. It fools you. It creates a way for you to look in the mirror at 45 with dyed hair and think, I'm not dead yet! <laughs> And instead of, instead of uh, you know, pinching your cheeks and putting a little blush on your lipstick and bouncing out of the house like you did when you were 18 or 20, after 45 minutes with the makeup, <laughs> then you look at yourself, blink twice, hope that the eyelashes don't stick together, and go, I'm not dead yet, again. So this is the kind of, you can't stay like that. You cannot keep yourself in that childlike, ridiculous idea. You, you, you must, at some point in your life, realize that life is going by very quickly and that you are going by with it. it, it and it's not, there's not a moment to be wasted. And that when it comes to who should practice and who should not practice, it is not for you to practice to impress your friends. It is not for you to practice because I want you to practice and it would please me, certainly not. It is not for you to practice because uh, you'll um, be, uh, you know, cheek by jowl with the other people here who are practicing. It is for you to practice because this is the nature of your situation. You are involved in the cycle of death and rebirth and life passes quickly and if you do not prepare for your next life, your next life will not be what you want it to be. That there is a very good chance that you will end up with a, with a lower rebirth or a, or a rebirth of extreme suffering. And so when you think about why you should embrace, embrace spirituality, particularly when you think why you should embrace the path of Dharma, don't do it for me, don't do it for the temple, don't do it because it's cool, do it because you must. When you give money to the temple, do it because you need to, not because we need you to. Do it because understand that you are the one that needs to practice the generosity. That's your medicine. Do not make the mistake that think, of thinking that your root guru or your lama is the one that needs the temple. It's completely false. It is not the lama that needs the temple. It is the students that practice there. This is not my temple in Poolsville, Maryland. This is your temple in Poolsville, Maryland. You should take pride in its cleanliness. You should take pride in its prosperity. It should embarrass you when the bills are not paid here. It should embarrass you when things are not going well at the temple, when there's not enough participation, when we can't find someone to cut the grass. Because this is your temple, this is your house. Spiritually, you live here. This is for you. If you could just get that one small truth and take responsibility for your practice, whether it's the karma yoga of engaging and protecting your temple, propagating the teachings, making this place firm and pure and safe for others to come and practice, or whether it's the meditational yoga of actually engaging in sit-down practice in order to benefit sentient beings, or both. Hopefully you're doing both because that's what's needed whether you're contemplating, teaching, offering, practicing, praying, meditating, whatever it is that you're doing, you're doing it because you must do this. You are repair, preparing for your next rebirth. I'm not a dope. I'm preparing for my next rebirth. Are you a dope? You have to prepare for your next rebirth. If I have to prepare, so do you. That's what is beautiful about your human existence right now. You have the capacity to prepare for your next rebirth. Other life forms cannot do that, but you can. And so I'm asking you, please, at whatever level you practice, whether you're just sniffing around, kind of interested, whether you're really getting with the program and you're starting to practice, or whether you're an old-time practitioner, the thoughts that turn the mind, those beginning thoughts that are in the beginning of your lindro practice, 
There is never a day in your life when you don't need to practice them because the day that you don't practice those thoughts, the day that you don't think about those thoughts, is the day you're going to start deluding yourself again and drinking, basically, the, the alcohol or the drug of samsara, which dupes you and tells you that there is no connection between cause and effect. And in fact, you are not getting older every day. And your life is going to go on for a very long time. These deluding thoughts. Don't wait until a life-challenging catastrophe to you or someone close to you teaches you this hard lesson. Please don't wait for that, because it will happen. Someday you're going to find out that you're dying. Or someday you're going to find out that someone near and dear to you is dying or has died. That is a life-changing experience, and it will teach you dharma. It will teach you to prepare for your next rebirth, if you're listening at all. On the other hand, there are even those that are so deluded, and I, this has happened to me, to students of mine, that they have been diagnosed as terminal, have been at death's door, and have decided they didn't want to spend their last months practicing dharma. They wanted to spend their last months having fun. This is the kind of delusion that is within our hearts and our minds now. And if you don't think that you have that in your mind, listen to your thoughts. Engage in some self-honesty and listen to how you think. This is what we're doing every day. Tossing it back, tossing it back. The drink of samsara. Keep it numb, keep it numb, because when we're numb, we don't have to face it. Well, there's another way, you see. You can be the kind of person that wants to keep it numb. You keep all the lights in your house off and try to walk around in there if you can. And what's ultimately going to happen is you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to fall over stuff. You're going to fall, you know, you're going to trip. You're going to bang into walls. You're going to burn yourself. All kinds of things will happen if you try to live with the lights on. But on the other hand, if you go through the effort, and this is like practicing Dharma, if you go through the effort of getting the big picture and you switch on the lights, even though it's effortful to go through this regime of doing this and paying attention and learning where the things are in your house, at least you know how it stands. And you can negotiate around in your house without bumping into walls and falling over the furniture. Our lives are like that. We have a choice. We can live our lives as the walking dead and then die, unprepared, like going to a continent filled with precious jewels and coming back empty-handed. Or we can switch on the lights, face facts, and do what it takes to negotiate the shoals of samsara painlessly, as painlessly as possible. <clears throat> the Buddha teaches us that we should think of our lives as like a burning room. and that the smoke is beginning to choke us, fill us up. And you know if you're in a burning room, eventually you're going to get burned. It's going to consume you, right? So think of ourselves as being in a burning room. <clears throat> and think that there is one door. That door is wide open to you. Do you get that? It is wide open to you. That door is the door of Dharma. There is one door by which to escape. And you, all, you can walk out that door, and you should think of the very doorway of that door as being your own root teacher. That is the, the implement, the tool that you should use to get out of that room. Your teacher, your practice, Dharma. If you were in a burning room right now, and your skin were beginning to crackle, and the smoke were beginning to overcome you, how would you think about that door? with fervent regard. <laughs> the way we are instructed to think about our practice, that door would look pretty much like God to you. That door would look like the best thing you ever saw. Every breath of air that came through that door would be sweeter than anything you have ever known, because that door is freedom. <clears throat> you should think about your practice that way, because that is the way it is. That is the way it is. 
in samsara here, we are locked in a burning room, and there is a door. And we have the great good fortune of not only seeing that door, but having the capacity to exit through that door. And not only that, but that door has a door sill that is friendly and helpful and appropriate for the size and shape of our bodies that will help us to exit that room comfortably. And that's how we should think about our practice. Number one, wake up. Number two, get the big picture. Number three, act as though you were sane and reasonable, pers reasonable person, which most of us don't act like. We don't act like sane and reasonable people. I'm not telling you anything you didn't know. You know that life is impermanent. You know that you have suffered. And you know that you feel unable to really face all these things because it seems so hard to simply live a virtuous life. But I can tell you that it's like anything else that you do for yourself, that you do as a friend for yourself that's good for you, such as changing your diet to, to really nutritious food. At first, when you do that, you know how it is when you're young, you can eat anything, a cast iron stomach. I mean, the things I ate when I was young, I can't even look at now. Now, I'm 45 years old and I have to eat right. If I don't eat right, I don't feel good. But do you remember what it took to change into learning how to live well in that regard? To go from eating the food that I liked to eating the food that I have learned to like <laughs> was hard and I didn't want to do it and I didn't think I was up to it. And to go from the kind of activity that I engaged in when I was younger. Oh, I could stay up all night if I wanted to, every night if I wanted to. I was amazing. I, I was just, I was a crazy girl. But now, if I don't get a certain amount of sleep, the next day I've got bags down to my knees. <laughs> you know, I'm just, it's horrible what life does to you. You look terrible and your whole face shows it. And you're, you feel awful and you, you feel like a dog. You feel off, worse than a dog. So, how did you feel when you had to change from those old habits to these new habits? At first, it was painful. You didn't want to do that. You didn't want to change. When you learned that your body was going to fall down if you didn't exercise, when you first started to exercise, you hated it. You hate it. Nobody likes it when they first start to exercise. It's painful. Your body doesn't want to do that. But then when you finally do start to exercise, your body likes it and loves it and it feels good. And Living a virtuous life is like that. At first, the decision to live a virtuous life is painful because you have to face the facts first. And the facts are, you're dying. You're dying on the hoof right now. And the second fact is that if you engage in virtuous activity, you'll be happy. And if you engage in non-virtuous activity, you will be unhappy. And that is not something we want to face. We want to do what we do effortlessly, la 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 la, like little children. We don't want to examine ourselves. We don't want to look at what we do. But once we have done that, we, we find, I found, and many of us who are practicing for some time now find that we come to love our practice. We come to deepen in it and truly love it. We come to love the life of Dharma. We come to love a life that is engaged in bringing benefit and happiness to others. We come to find out at last that we never, not for a moment, liked ourselves when we were living the other way, the non-virtuous way, the no-brainer. We never liked ourselves. There was no self-esteem happening there at all. So then my suggestion is we get started. Go through it. Fuck up, little soldier. Do what it takes to stand up tall and open your heart and get the big picture. And then once you do that and you start to engage in a virtuous life, your mind will be smoother. You will be happier. You will be happier. This I promise you. In the meantime, because our minds work the way they do and because we can't see the direct relationship between cause and effect, we have to listen to our teachers. There's no other choice. Because our teachers have crossed the ocean of suffering. As, just as the Buddha has done. 
crossed the over ocean of suffering and have returned for our sake. And our teachers, having seen the further shore and having seen the journey there and back, have come back to bring us this understanding. Live this way. <coughs> bring your life to the pinnacle of what it can be and hold it steady and grow up because that's what it takes to be happy. Thank you.